Good afternoon and welcome to Energene's webinar series. My name is Yael and I'm part of the marketing team and I'll be your host for today. In today's webinar, we'll discuss the canola's past and present diversity captured through its pangenome. We will present the work and the results of the pangenome consortium as well as future applications. At the end of the webinar, we will save some time for questions. So we encourage you to send in your questions at any time during the presentation by using the questions tab on the left side of your screen. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website in case you wanna to listen to it again. I am honored to present today's distinguished lineup of speakers. Starting with academic I am honored to present today's distinguished lineup of speakers. Starting with academic leaders, Dr. Isabel Parkin, who together with Dr. Dr. Andrew Sharp led the International Canola Pangenome Consortium. Dr. Isabel Parkin has been a research scientist with the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada since 1999 and has served as an adjunct professor at the University of Saskatchewan since 2004. Her research, her research interests include brassica genomics and genetics, comparative genome organization, and control of homologous recombination. Dr. Andrew Sharp is a director of genomics and bioinformatics at the Global Institute for Food Security. Among his many accomplishments, Andrew was co-lead for the Geno Genome Canada Canadian Triticum Applied Genomics Project and established the Omics and Precision Agriculture Laboratory at the Global Institute for Food Security. He was also appointed the program director for the Plant Phenotyping and Imaging Research Center in 2008. And with perfect timing, we would like to congratulate our next guest, who has announced the winner of the Canadian Plant Breeding Innovation Award, Dr. Van Ripley. Dr. Ripley has over 30 years of canola breeding experience and has contributed to several major developments in the canola industry. During his long career, Van has served as a research scientist at AAFC, Saskatoon Research Center, and as a canola breeder at Dow Sunflower Program until 2008, when he started his current role as Canola North American R&D lead at New Seed. And last but not least, our own Dr. Sharon Breichov. Sharon has been practicing agriculture his entire life. He serves as Senior Director of Genomic Solutions at Energene, where he leads a team of technical experts. He has worked in the AG Tech um, computational biology industry for a decade and has been with Energene for four years. And with that, we will now begin. Andrew, the stage is yours. Andrew, we can't hear you. Hello everyone, sorry about the delay there. Um, my name's uh, Andy Sharp, yeah, and as mentioned, I'm at the Global Institute for Food Security here in Saskatoon. Uh, principal role in, in uh, leading genomics and bioinformatics at the Institute, and involved in leading uh, projects and initiatives such as the, the Pan Genome Initiative and also the establishment of the Omics platform, service platform, the OPAL, uh, that was mentioned in the introduction. So yes, I'm the co-lead uh, on the academic side for the project, along with Isabel Parkin at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, also here in, in Saskatoon. And myself and Isabel will give an introduction to the crop. I'll give the introduction to the crop, and then, then she'll give an introduction to the, uh, I guess, the state of the art with the genomics and genetics, um, and the, the rationale behind developing a pan genome for the crop. So, uh, yeah, okay. so um, 
the crop. It's a very important crop to Canadian agriculture, um, grown principally across Western Canada on the prairies, um, and Saskatoon is right in the middle of the, a prime growing area for the crop. It is also grown out in Eastern Canada as well uh, as, a, as a smaller uh, acre, acre crop. In total, there's about 20 million acres uh, of canola grown across uh, the country and about 20 million tons annually. And there's a lot of farmers who are, who are growing the crop, over 40,000 of them. And it's, it's a key um, cash crop uh, for farmers. Um, and also, uh, it's a key rotational crop uh, for them as well. So a very important crop for the country. And I guess also globally, because uh, a large proportion of the crop is actually exported um, internationally. Uh, it's a high quality food oil. Um, so it's of major significance both for Canada and the world. And a key aim uh, for breeders is to push um, the yield up higher, of course, uh, similar for many crops. But there's a, a ambitious aim to increase uh, um, from about 40 bushels per acre at the moment to about 50 bushels per acre over the course of the next five to 10 years. So that's a, a um, uh, a significant goal um, and uh, of course there's resources that are required for that and a key thing are advanced uh, genomic resources uh, getting an idea about the spread of diversity across the, the genome for the crop and with that introduction of the crop I'll hand over to Isabel now who will focus on the genetics and, and genomics for the crop as well. Thank you. So um, thanks, Andy, for that introduction to the crop. So I am going to, as Andy mentioned, just talk briefly about the genetics of um, Brassica napus and what we've learned so far over the decades of research in Brassica napus to understand a little bit about the genome structure of um, Brassica napus and what that implies for um, variation and the variation that we're trying to find. So the first slide. Um, it's really just giving a bit of a history of what we've learned about Brassica napus over the years using different technologies. Um, initially, um, I'm sure most people know that work in Brassica napus and that it's an allopolyploid crop. And through cytogenetics, it became apparent that it was formed from the fusion of two smaller diploid genomes. So Brassica ulcerata and Brassica rapa fused to form Brassica napus. And then um, in the, in the 90s, molecular markers became prevalent in research and we were able to differentiate those two underlying diploid genomes within the napus nucleus. And that was a, a very interesting discovery that the fact that the two diploid genomes could be very easily seen within the nucleus, but it was also very apparent that they were quite closely related and there was extreme uh, regions of syntony or homology between these two diploid genomes within that nucleus. And that's actually led to some interesting features within the genome structure of napus that I'll touch on later. Um, and then lastly, in 2014, uh, a large group of the community worked together to publish the first Brassica napus genome sequence using short read sequence data. And that was um, <clears throat> very important in allowing us to basically have a, a very in-depth uh, map of the Brassica genome and allowed us to look a bit more about how the genes worked with each other. I don't, I... So um, working in Brassica napus, our other advantage is the fact that it's very closely related to one of the most well-studied species, and that is Arabidopsis thaliana. And the reason that this has been very useful, not only in understanding the functionality of a lot of the genes within the genome, but it's also allowed us to understand more about the genome structure of napus and this evolution. 
Now, Brassingham napus, like most angiosperms, has evolved through a series of polyploidization and diploidization events. And this is a, a brief schematic of that, um, of the evolutionary scale over millions of years. But the two L events that have really had a big impact on the sort of variation within the genome and um, the phenotypes that we observe and the variation for those phenotypes are one is the Braska specific genome triplication event, which led to the ancestral Braska genome from which both the two diploids, Rafa and Ulrace, were formed. So this um, ancestral triplication event, um, then there was a fair amount of rearrangement, but still you could see these three copies within each of the diploid genome. And then this effect of hexaploids were then hybridized to form the rather complex genome that we see in the polyploid today. And um, <clears throat> the consequences of this polyploidy is such that if you look at just the triplication event, um, as with most new polyploids, the, the genomes had to undergo uh, a mechanism of creating balance within the genome, dealing with these duplicate gene copies. And this has led to fractionation or effectively copy number variants and structural variants for number of genes across the three copies within each of the diploid genomes. So we have a variance between uh, basically one and three copies within the diploids and effectively um, up to two to six generally copies of genes within the actual allopoid genome. And the next step in <clears throat> uh, the, hybrid, the hybridization of these two diploid genomes led to another interesting facet of Braska napus um, genetics, and that is the fact that every neopolyploid or new polyploid genome has to work out a mechanism of a normal pairing between the homologs and preventing pairing between the homologs. But within Braska napus, we've seen intrinsically that there is a some level of homologous or exchange between these um, two diploid genomes within the nucleus that has led to novel structural variation. And that was very clear from the sequencing of the NAPIS genome. So this is from the original publication. And using short read data, you can see very clearly the red regions are duplicated regions and the blue are deleted. And we saw a correspondence between homologous regions across the two diploids that showed evidence of homologous exchange between these diploid genomes. And these actually led to phenotypes that were then selected inadvertently in the field in the adaptation of Braska napus. And one of the, the, the most quoted ones of these is the fact that the low glucosinolate phenotype that's led to the canola quality that we see today, one of those loci is actually a result of one of these homologous exchanges between the diploid genomes. So this um, interesting facet leads to a fair amount, can lead to structural variation within the genome. Um, monitoring or measuring that, I have problems moving to the next slide. Next slide. So thank you. So monitoring or measuring that um, these homologous exchange events is actually still quite a difficult, um, a difficult objective. And so we can do it with short read sequencing data as was done originally. So you can see that here where we've shown the short read data in the center of the figure. And that's for an exchange between A9 and C9. And latterly, we've been able to use SNP data to actually identify some of these events across the genome and utilize this uh, the SNP uh, data to identify novel events and look at the extent of this variation within the NAPIS genome. But you have to remember that SNP data is obviously going to be um, biased depending on the ascertainment bias on your arrays. Um, so although we can look at these events, we're probably limited by our current technologies. So structural variation within NAPIS look, using these types of techniques has allowed us to see that within cultivated NAPIS, there is ongoing evidence of these homologous events, which is creating structural variation that can be selected for and can lead to adaptation of new and novel traits. So we're very interested in looking at the extent of this variation 
And beyond that, um, this is um, a figure from a recent publication from Rod Snowden's lab, which looked at, again, using resequencing data to identify structural variation, focusing in particular on small insertions and deletions, um, which generally have been missed with things like resequencing data looking at SNP variation. And these events were very clearly seen across the genomes. And interestingly, so obviously you can't see any detail here, but the, the red and the yellow represent evidence of insertions and deletions across 12 different neighbors genotypes. And you can see the prevalence of this type of variation. And in fact, it was estimated that up to 10% of this type of variation creates, has affected genes within the genome, which could lead to changes in phenotype. And there were very specific, um, what appear to be sort of adaptive regions where uh, in the bottom right, this is actually a, a differentiation of spring types. So you're seeing ecotype differences based on this type of structural variation. So because of the extent of these types of variation, we were, we realized, I mean, as most um, people working in crops have realized that a single genome is insufficient to give you a good estimation of the, the level of variation you have and the possibility of what diversity you can capture. Um, so that's why we were very interested in, in having access to a pan genome and not only being able to just look at presence or absence of genes, but really being able to sort of have an in-depth look at the structural variation in, say, regulatory regions and in, in flanking regions of genes. And this type of variation and the extent of it can only really be captured with whole genome sequencing, which is why we were very interested in being involved in the pan genome project for Braska Napus. And um, I'm not going to discuss any of the details of this because that this is going to steal some of Sharon's funder. So Sharon now will give you um, an update on what's occurred and where we are with the project to date. Thank you, Isabel. Um, so before we go back to speak about the canola pan genome, let's uh, spend a few seconds talking about Enerogene. So we are a relatively young company, uh, been around for a little over a decade. Um, first, primarily focused in R&D, and uh, the last five or six years, uh, we've been um, actively engaged in different uh, commercial and academic academic project. We, are, we have just now finalized our IPO, which we are very uh, fond of and uh, proud of. Um, uh, over the course of the years, we've been walking uh, throughout the globe, doing many projects, had uh, uh, a lot of customers, a lot of species, uh, many assemblies have been gone through and our uh, work has been already published in, in, in quite a few uh, uh, peer-reviewed publications. Um, um, now, I, I won't go a lot in details about this, but we try to give uh, all-inclusive support for breeding. It starts with a reference, uh, goes on to comparative genomics, diversity analysis, genotyping solution, and and prediction so that uh, molecular breeding can occur. What we are focusing uh, here when we are talking about the pan genome is the comparative genomic part. So uh, Isabel already uh, discussed it, so I'll only mention it uh, briefly. Why do we need pan genomes? When you just use a single reference, uh, you can have both um, false discovery due to misalignment, you can have uh, um, um, uh, also um, negative uh, results uh, due to uh, some of the sequence not mapping anywhere in your reference. That's diversity that you are missing out. And also the type of diversity that you can expect to find is limited to only very uh, small differences, SNPs and small indels. So structural variations are very hard to detect when you are just using a single reference. And that's the motivation um, that we uh, that we have uh, to introduce different pan genome in different species, including canola. Um, so, what do we actually do in, in the analysis? This is uh, an analysis that was completed and delivered to the consortium members. Um, 
basically let's assume in this illustration that you have six different genomes they are all de novo assembled using our de novo magic tool uh, and following that um, you what we produce is a linear uh, or a collinear map that basically um, finds all the places of an exact match between every pair of genomes uh, so that in those uh, exact match location, you can have base pair resolution coordinate conversion. And in those places where the genomes do not match, you have uh, an approximation of the coordinate conversion. You know that it falls between the two adjacent matching regions. And um, this way we are mapping every pair uh, of genomes in the pan genome so that essentially you have a structure, a data structure that represents all of the different genomes and you can use that instead of a reference. You can map sequence to, to its best match and then uh, as a consequence have it mapped to every other genome due to this um, um, collinear map that was produced. Um, after we are doing that, uh, next step is homology-based annotation. We take a known and curated um, transcript set um, from the same species um, and we map it uh, to all of the genomes using the same pipeline with the same parameters. And after we have these two different inputs, we can basically um, introduce, literally introduce colors. So uh, in, in this uh, comparison, we use the linear mapping and uh, the homology between the different sets of transcripts to actually find places where there's um, presence absence variation, meaning I have a transcript in one genome, but there's no high homology partner anywhere in the, in the other genome. It can be a copy number variation where you do have um, a, a good homolog in the other genome, but it's already matched to another uh, um, gene, so it's an extra copy, uh, which is actually um, can be pretty prevalent in canola and also in other species. And also you can uh, detect uh, what we call um, proximal and distal structural variants. That basically means a proximal uh, structural variant means that you have uh, two matching genes, but they are not in the same position but are um, slightly uh, uh, apart. And uh, um, a distal one uh, basically says they are way apart, either um, um, it can be the opposite sides of the same chromosome or even uh, uh, another chromosome altogether. And we have another uh, status of uncertain, which is basically, well, we are not sure if it's an artifact or if it's something else. Uh, it could be interesting, but we can't actually um, place it in any of the other cat uh, categories. Obviously, the blue color says that it's the, the gene is a match, meaning uh, there's a good homology partner in the same genome, and it's also in the other genome, and it's also located approximately in the same position. Um, those are uh, genomes that we've done this analysis so far. Uh, I'm distinguishing between uh, homozygote and the heterozygote pan genome because the pipeline that actually does it is different. In heterozygote species, you need to account for the fact that you have two, uh, two different uh, copies of every uh, chromosome and that makes the analysis a bit more complicated. Um, obviously, uh, in the homozygous genomes, you do see cotton and canola that are um, uh, tetraploid, uh, which kind of makes them a bit uh, uh, similar to the heterozygote ones. But since it's an allopolyploid and we have good, uh, a good way to distinguish between homologs, we can analyze them as if they were uh, diploids. Um, those are the assembly results. There's a lot of numbers here. Um, I can uh, go briefly about it. Uh, from the people of you that, uh, that are doing this, you can appreciate the fact that you have a high continuity assembly of high quality capturing most of the gene content um, uh, as uh, um, you can see from the BUSCO scores. Um, for the ones that are less, um, less familiar with that, uh, I would like to show you this. So though, uh, at the left you see the 
the actual averages of the statistics over uh, 12 genomes. By the way, maybe we should spend a bit of time talking about the different um, uh, contributing uh, lines here. So we have both spring and winter, and the uh, and we have basically uh, six different partners, each uh, contributing two varieties. Uh, so this is the consortium, and those are the results um, that um, should give a good capture of the uh, entire diversity in in Brassica napus. Uh, going back here, so basically, what do we see here? We have a high end 50, meaning scaffolds tend to be long uh, um, uh, and accurate. Um, also, the N90 is is very nice, and that basically means that uh, when you look at the figure to the right, if you, uh, this is a, um, a, a synteny plot of KMERS uh, between scaffolds of one assembly and the reference genome. You can see that the results are very accurate, uh, um, very little noise, and whenever there's a de deviation from the collinearity, you can actually uh, already realize what you have here. So here you see an example of an inversion, it's very clear. Um, um, other places where you see some fuzzy uh, ends, that could mean that you have some structural variance, maybe that um, a piece of sequence actually is placed on another chromosome, or it could mean a whole different uh, things. The main thing is that uh, the entire chromosome is, is captured by a very small number of very long scaffolds that are accurate and phased, and uh, you can use that to, um, uh, to actually study those uh, those differences and uh, uh, get to the biology from all of that informatics. Um, those are the uh, results of the an annotation comparison that I talked about it before. So on average, where for every comparison that we've made, 85% um, are a match, meaning you, the, the, the two genes are um, with good homology and are uh, approximately in the same position. You do see um, almost 7% um, of different structural variants, uh, and that's in the gene level. Genes tend to be more conserved than other regions, so that's probably an underestimate if you do the same analysis at the uh, sequence uh, level. And also around 2% uh, have copy number variation, presence absence being a very specific case of copy number variation. And another 6% are uncertain. It can mean uh, all, all of the other categories, uh, or it can be an artifact. We, we don't really know, but there's a lot to explore there. Um, one question that's very often asked whenever we do a pan genome is, how many lines are enough to fully capture so for that, we've actually started doing um, a cumulative analysis where we start with the annotation of one genome, and then we start comparing it to another one and then adding another one. Uh, and and uh, by that, you can actually see with each new line that is added, um, have we reached saturation? Have we reached the core transcriptome represented by the blue graph? And have we reached the unique one, meaning have we captured all the possible um, gene level variation uh, that are there to explore? I can say that uh, in general that this graph did not reach saturation. There's still uh, an addition of around two or three percent, uh, even with the addition of the last um, the last contributing line. Um, the question, is it enough, is, more, is I guess trickier because the, you need to ask, is it enough for me, for my purposes, whether I'm a breeder or um, uh, doing basic research, um, is this sufficient for the research question that, that I want to ask? Um, I think that remains an open question. I do want to remind you that this is all done only on the transcript level. Transcripts tend to be more conserved, and it's even um, uh, not quantifying uh, this analysis at least. The sequence variation that does exist between even between two um, transcripts that are deemed to be 
um, in very good homology. So there's a lot more to explore here, uh, which I'm sure uh, the consortium members, uh, as well as uh, Isabel and Andy, would would have fun uh, doing. Um, this is how the results can be visualized in our pan genome browser. So you basically, it's based on IGV, if any of you is using, but there's a few uh, features that were introduced by Enogen. I took a, a place that looked interesting on chromosome 14. Um, at the top, you see um, an annotation track. That's the output of our annotation uh, for the specific pivot um, genome. Uh, that was uh, used here. Um, and uh, underneath it, you start to see comparison to different lines. Um, and the color is as indicated before. So basically, you, you do see here um, distal structural variant, meaning the homologue in this case actually exists in chromosome 15 and not 14. Uh, there's some proximal uh, um, um, differences. In this case, the homologue is around a little over a million bases upstream in that other genome. And uh, there's two gray cases where there is a transcript there. It does resemble the transcript of interest that's uh, displayed here above, uh, but it's uh, around 60% homology. So it could be um, another um, another gene, it could be a pseudogene, or it could be something that really underwent a rapid evolution and has a, a different function. We really don't know, and obviously each one that has its own uh, gene of interest or region of interest can actually uh, use these results and explore them and get to these conclusions. And now I would like uh, to introduce uh, uh, the stage to uh, Van Ripley, showing how these results can be used by a commercial uh, company that is breeding canola. Yes, hello everyone. This is Van Ripley um, from New Seed uh, Canola, uh, Canola. I was asked by the organizers as a participating company in the in the Pan Genome Consortium project to give an update as to um, how we see the value of the Pan Genome for our program. So I'll start off by just giving a brief overview of New Seed's uh, global program, uh, since many may not be familiar with it. New Seed is a um, Australian company uh, that has been um, marketing varieties for uh, for many years. They have greater than 50% market share in the Australian market. Um, one of the key things about New Seed's strategy going forward is that um, we're really focused on quality improvements in canola. And these are typically uh, traits that are controlled by many genes. Our company uh, marketing uh, uh, phrase is value beyond yield, which means that we, we are developing high yielding, obviously, canola varieties and, and hybrids. Uh, but we also see there's tremendous value there for improving uh, quality in canola further. We have a ger uh, diverse germplasm base uh, working with the major herbicide tolerance types as well that are acquired by the, by the market. Uh, for about the last seven years, New Seed has been testing um, germplasm in North America to, to try to identify um, adapted uh, germplasm and starting to use that to introduce uh, novel uh, hybrids to the market. Our first commercial product uh, products were introduced in 2020, and you see them there. These are canola quality uh, hybrids um, with TruFlex and with uh, club root resistance in the case of 527. Um, another major project for the company is we're, we're working to introduce um, omega-3 varieties to the marketplace. Currently, these are being grown under contract in the United States. And by omega-3, I mean we're really focusing on developing um, high DHA and EPA uh, lines, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, soon. 
Uh, and we do have a Innovation and Molecular Breeding Center in Sacramento in California, which just opened in 2020. So this just is, a, is a, a schematic showing you the overall breeding program. Um, new seed, as I mentioned, in North America, we're very new to the market and we have to compete, obviously, um, against major players such as Corteva, um, BSF, and Bayer. And in order to do that, we really need to develop the best possible um, new hybrids to bring to the market. Um, but also while still trying to address our strategy of, of improving um, uh, quality traits within canola. So really the first part of our program here um, marker for marker discovery and really pre-breeding or really focusing on a lot of those quality traits um, is where we see a good value for application of, of the information we've, uh, we've gotten through the pan, canola pan genome. Um, a couple of the of the key targets that we have for um, for quality improvement uh, are shown here: high oleic low linolenic acid and uh, omega-3. In the case of the high oleic low linolenic acid, um, it is known in the industry and, and lots of publications around the major fat genes controlling those traits. Um, and with the omega-3 uh, program. Um, we had worked for many years, New Seed has worked for many years with CSIRO in Canberra, and they were successful to introduce um, a construct, a transgenic construct with eight uh, genes that result in the elevation of the DHA um, and EPA um, fatty acids in the product. Uh, however, for, for a lot of these quality traits, um, even though the major genes are known, there's really very little uh, known about the background um, genes. So you often hear about uh, background effects of expression of these genes, and there's really very little known about the genetic control of that. So we really do need to be able to take a much more genomics focused approach to, to be able to develop um, the best possible products uh, relative to, to those types of traits. This just gives you a, just a picture of what it looks like in the field, of course, in Western Canada. Um, DHA uh, canola or um, omega-3 canola is a novel oil protein within the canola crop. It, has, it does not obviously occur naturally within canola. It was uh, introduced uh, through transgenic approach. Um, we're really looking to elevate as high as possible very long chain fatty acids, particularly DHA and EPA, and this will be this is because it, this oil would be very well suited for use in aquaculture because it, repla it can replace fish oil um, in the rations um, more cost effectively. So aquaculture uh, globally has been expanding. Uh, some predictions are that by uh, 2030, uh, the aquaculture industry could double globally. And so um, currently the main source of, of these very long chain fatty acids in, in um, aquaculture feed rations is, other, is oil from other fish. But um, global stocks are really not, um, not gonna be able to support expansion of agriculture. And um, really uh, we needed to have a much more uh, a sustainable method for producing uh, this type of oil. And we feel that's, that can be done in plants. Um, but like I said, this is a complex trait and um, we, we do need complex tools such as, uh, as the canola pan genome uh, to be able to uh, work with them effectively. Um, so this is a slide actually from NR gene, but you know, I just wanted to highlight uh, again that by mapping all to all, it really gives you a, a good understanding of um, the whole genome mapping uh, as it says, showing areas of homology and sequence polymorphism. Um, the value for, part of the value for us at New Seed was that we had the opportunity as participants in the consortium to put two inbred lines into, into the uh, program. So you may have noticed on the previous slides that were shown by Sharon, uh, 45B and 58B. So these are, these are key inbred lines within New Seed's program. And so, um, 
that also was a was a big uh, attraction uh, for us. Um, the outputs that we got out of this they were highlighted before, but um, it was really development development of the pan genome database uh, allows um, or which we have access to. Uh, one other area which wasn't touched on too much, but which we're very interested in is a haplotype database for capturing genetic diversity. Those of you that know anything about canola or much about canola know that historically it was an open pollinated bread crop. So it was bred as pure lines and really only within the last uh, 15 to 20 years is converted to a hybrid uh, crop and now is um, mainly hybrid worldwide but um, it you know really we need to have good tools around understanding genetic diversity germplasm diversity to be able to um, effectively develop our gene pools our female pools and male pools and tease apart some of this uh, cross pool backgrounds that had gone on historically um, this will allow us to design optimal marker sets across the germplasm and um, target sequences uh, only when need to add to haploid diversity. So the value to us is really identify, identification of unique regions in our germplasm. Um, we, we can target those areas for um, uh, better marker development uh, for our high throughput lab to support breeding uh, each cycle. It also can be uh, help us to get down to the sequence level ultimately. Um, and then, as I mentioned, another key area for us really is the development of the haplotype database to allow for genomic prediction of complex traits as we go forward. Um, from a practical point of view, uh, new seed globally is a, is would, would fall under the category of a small or medium enterprise. Worldwide, for all crops, we have approximately 400 uh, uh, employees, and we're working in uh, canola, carinata, uh, sorghum, and sunflowers. Um, and as I mentioned, we just completed our new uh, genomics molecular breeding facility in California. However, we really need the, the time to develop um, the internal capability in genomics and bioinformatics and gene editing um, type technologies. And as I mentioned, um, when I was talking about our competitors, we really don't have the time uh, to delay using use of these tools. Um, because we, we have to compete against other companies that are already using um, very advanced tools. So um, ultimately this was, you know, we determined this is a cost-effective way to rapidly accelerate our internal uh, molecular breeding uh, capacity. And we see we will continue to work with NRG as we go forward uh, around other aspects of the, of the use of the pan genome, such as the haplotype, haplotype database. Thank you, Van, and thank you to all our speakers for this interesting talk. Um, and now we do have some time for questions from the audience. Um, we'll start with a question for Isabel. Our first question um, is, how do you choose the samples for this pan genome project? Mm, okay, uh, that's a good question, although, um, so, uh, I think it was mentioned by Sharon, but the, the makeup of the the pan genome was basically each individual member of the consortium contributed two lines. Um, so they were mostly chosen based on the individual interests of each of the members, while each of the members also realized that contributing as much diversity as possible was important in, in making a functional pan genome that was going to be of value to the whole crop. So there was some discussion at the time when people were submitting lines as to whether we had information about um, commonality among the lines, but having said that, each of the members selected lines based on their current interests. Thank you, Isabel. Um, the next question is for Sharon. What tool is used for linear genome mapping steps? Well, I... Yeah, the, the last part of your question wasn't heard, so it was uh, referring to a, a tool called Minimap2. 
uh, no, uh, generally speaking, energy usually uses proprietary tools that are um, developed specifically uh, for those tasks. That's also true in this case. Uh, we have a, a tool that optimizes um, the collinear mapping between each combination of two genomes. Um, and, and that's the tool that is used and it produces something that we can uh, use uh, uh, very um, uh, successfully so that uh, downstream uh, a very accurate haplotype database can be built on that foundation as, as Van Ripley uh, um, said. Thank you, Sharon. Um, the next question will be for Van. What breeding related questions can you answer with a pan genome and could not use other methods to answer before? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think that it, it's not an either or in terms of, um, you know, because there is a, there are a lot of other techniques and tools that you could use. I think the real value for new seed was the fact that, um, as I mentioned uh, in my talk, since we're just starting uh, getting our genomics and molecular breeding program going, we don't have the internal capability uh, to generate um, this level of information. and um, and so it was a very good option for us. Um, I do think that, um, you know, if you look at some of the information that Sharon has shown, uh, they're, by taking the approach that they've taken with the all-to-all -all comparison, it does avoid some of the pitfalls of relying on a single reference genome, uh, that, which Sharon uh, highlighted. But for us, as I mentioned, the main thing was relative to the fact that it was a very good, op it's a very good opportunity for us to rapidly accelerate the tools that we have at our at our disposal for use in our program. Thank you, Van. Uh, next question. Does it help or bias results if you include a previously assembled genome to generate a new pan genome with new samples? Would you rather have all genomes undergone the same de novo assembly pipeline? Um, and this question is directed for Isabel or Sharon. Okay, so uh, I can answer uh, um, from from the technical perspective. Uh, yeah, we can use existing assemblies. Um, the main problem here is that if uh, that existing assembly is of uh, lower quality, it may uh, bias the results. Um, so we do need to make sure that any genome that's introduced is of uh, sufficient quality uh, sufficient length and continuity and uh, uh, relatively error-free. Isabel, do you want to add anything? Okay, we will move on to the next question. Um, and this one is um, also for Sharon. Are the scaffolds assemblies assembled de novo or based on reference? Yeah, so all the scaffolds are completely de novo assembled. Uh, it starts with the plant tissue, DNA is extracted, sequence is generated, and the only input is that sequence from that line. Um, the only use that we make of an existing reference is to order the scaffolds into pseudomolecules, uh, although we can also use a genetic map for that same purpose. Um, going on to our next question, this is for Isabel. Do you suppose there is additional relevant canola diversity that was not included in the current project? Isabel? Thank you. Sorry, I was muted by the organizer. <laughs> um, uh, there probably is diversity that we haven't covered, especially if you consider um, the full phenotypic diversity for breast canopus. It may not be of relevance necessarily to canola breeding, but we haven't included any vegetable types. Um, but there is likely to be interesting diversity within those lines that could potentially have value for certain agronomic traits. And, um, and also, 
you'll notice that within the lines we haven't included any semi-winter lines, although we do have um, material of sort of um, from the east in there. We don't have necessarily any semi-winter types which would contribute additional diversity potentially. Um, so yes, there there are probably missing elements among that genome. And you, but you will notice from Sharon's talk that as he was, we were adding the genomes, we are getting to the cusp of what is the predicted diversity within the genome. So I would think that with only a few more very highly selected choices, we could actually um, encompass most of the useful diversity. Great, thank you. Um, our next question um, is for Sharon. How do you deal with sequences or scaffolds that are not mapping to the pivot genome? Thank you. So uh, basically mapping rates are high. Most of the scaffolds, since they are long, uh, it allows us to, to map uh, a lot of them. Um, but uh, the sequences that are not mapped are also maintained uh, as part of the assembly and, and are actually participating in downstream analysis even if they do not have uh, um, a chromosome position. Thank you. Um, the next question is, would the pan genome be published? I guess I can answer that. Um, yes, it will be. Uh, that was part of the uh, agreement um, with uh, all the partners, the academic, NRG, and the industry partners, that ultimately the, uh, the work can be uh, can be published. So we've, we've obviously got to go through a ra um, rounds of analysis. and. Uh, we're at the point where we've, we've uh, re received genomes, uh, assembled genomes, and, and some analysis, but we have to do quite a bit more analysis, um, and, so, and then go through development of the manuscript and ultimately a publication. So there's going to be um, uh, you know, a, um, a bit of a delay in, in terms of uh, getting publication out. Hopefully, within the next year, we'll get that achieved, and, um, and then there'll be a public availability of the resource. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Um, this question is for Sharon. What would be expected if you introduced highly diverse samples into a pan magic analysis? Well, to begin with, um, that's what we call an interesting uh, comparison. We want to compare between diverse lines. Uh, if if the diversity is very high, it could um, challenge. It could be a bit more challenging to to um, to produce the mapping. Uh, but as long as it's the same species, if the chromosomes know how to pair, we can also pair them uh, in silico. That's basically the way that we. Uh, see it, uh, and if the chromosomes do not pair, then basically we we can we we can introduce it in another pan genome and not the canola one. Uh, obviously, when you are comparing the diverse um, diverse lines, then the results would uh, um, would uh, introduce a relatively large or larger amounts of copy number variation and pre presence absence variation and also structural variation, which is exactly why we want, uh, or uh, generally speaking, uh, why uh, pangenomes are created, uh, because that's exactly what we want to research. Thank you, Sharon. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all your questions, but please note that we will follow up by email to answer them after the webinar. I'd like again to thank all our speakers for their time today. Thank you for sharing with us your presentations. This webinar was recorded and we'll have it available in the next few days. So keep an eye out for our email with the link to the recording. We will also have it up on our website. If you have any further questions or an interesting research project you'd like to discuss with our experts, please don't hesitate to contact us at nrgene.com. Thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.